If you've noticed memory loss or thinking problems in an older person, you may have wondered if it might be Alzheimer's. But it's also common for people to be told it's mild cognitive impairment or perhaps dementia. That's because these three conditions are related, but they aren't quite the same thing. So what's the difference? Stay tuned to find out. Hello everyone, welcome to Helping Older Parents with Memory Loss, a video podcast series that gives you strategies and information about assisting aging parents who are experiencing memory or thinking problems. I'm your host, Dr. Leslie Kernison, board certified geriatrician and the founder of Better Health While Aging and also of the Helping Older Parents online programs. In today's episode, I'm going to address another frequently asked question, which is this. What is the difference between Alzheimer's disease, dementia, and mild cognitive impairment? This is really important for older adults and families to understand, because if your aging parent does get a medical evaluation for symptoms of memory loss or other thinking problems, you may well be told it's one of these three conditions. So let's go through what they all are. That way, if you're told your parent might have one of these conditions, you'll have a better understanding of what the doctors are talking about and you'll be in a better position to help your parent get treatment and care. So in this video, I'm actually gonna walk you through four terms that I think are really useful for you to understand. They are one, cognitive impairment, because this is the symptom that your parent should initially be evaluated for. Two, mild cognitive impairment, also known as MCI. Three, dementia, and four, Alzheimer's disease. If you follow along, then by the end of this video, you should understand the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia, and you'll also understand how mild cognitive impairment fits into the picture. So let's get started. So first, what do I mean by cognitive impairment? Well, cognition means your brain's various thinking processes. So cognitive impairment means there's some kind of problem or difficulty with a person's memory, thinking, concentration, or with other functions of the conscious brain. If a person has become forgetful, confused, is hallucinating, is delusional, or maybe is even simply way more spaced out than usual, all of that can be considered cognitive impairment. We're basically talking about symptoms and signs indicating that the brain is not working as it should. Now, cognitive impairment is a broad kind of symptom, kind of like shortness of breath. It's a sign that an organ, in this case the brain, is malfunctioning. Cognitive impairment can come on suddenly or gradually. It can be temporary or more permanent. It may or may not keep getting slowly worse. It all depends on the underlying cause or causes of the brain malfunction. If you wanna learn more about the most common causes of memory loss and other forms of cognitive impairment in older adults, including the causes that are more temporary or reversible, be sure to check out my other video in which I go through these causes in detail. But for now, what I want you to take away is that cognitive impairment is a general term, referring to signs that the brain's memory or thinking processes are not working as they should. Now, let's now talk about mild cognitive impairment, which is often referred to by the acronym MCI. So this I would describe actually as a syndrome and also a diagnosis. Now in medicine, a syndrome means a group of symptoms or characteristics that are often seen together. It's what can be seen externally. It can be observed by doctors or perhaps detected when they do certain types of tests in the office or maybe through blood work. But with many syndromes, it's often unclear what's the underlying cause. Or it's possible that there are multiple underlying causes, especially when it comes to older adults. So for instance, falls in older adults are considered a geriatric syndrome. The external characteristics that we can observe are that an older person is falling or is having frequent near falls, but there are many underlying medical problems that can cause this, and usually in older adults there are multiple underlying causes for falls. So what is mild cognitive impairment or MCI? This basically means that a person is experiencing a decline in some aspect of memory or thinking, but it's not bad enough to interfere with independence in daily life activities. And that decline in cognitive abilities should be objective, meaning that some type of testing shows that the memory problems or thinking difficulties are worse than expected for the person's age and education level. And it should seem to be a decline from how the person was before. 
Now, many people as they age experience what we call subjective memory loss. This means that the person feels like their memory is worse than it was or is worse than it should be, but when their memory or other thinking skills are objectively tested by a doctor or other health provider, it still falls within the range of what's considered normal for the person's age and education level. If that's the case, then we would not say that they're currently meeting the criteria for mild cognitive impairments. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't take their concerns seriously, because of course we should. It's just that having some form of objectively confirmed decline in cognition is part of the diagnostic criteria for MCI. So, what are those diagnostic criteria? They are these. First, that the person has a cognitive complaint, often memory, but sometimes it's something else, and preferably it's confirmed by someone else who knows the person and has also noticed that their memory or thinking seems a little different than before. Next, it's that there's objective evidence of cognitive impairment, and usually we obtain this through doing some form of office space cognitive testing, such as a MOCA test or maybe more involved testing with a neuropsychologist. Third, there should be what we call preserved general cognitive function. This basically means that most of the brain's thinking processes otherwise seem to be working adequately. An additional criteria is that the person should also have what we call intact general functioning. This basically means that the person can still manage their usual daily life tasks on their own, such as driving, finances, or grocery shopping. And the last criteria is that the person should not be meeting criteria for dementia. But we'll talk about just what that means in a moment. When a person meets these criteria that I just described, they can be diagnosed with MCI. It's also now called mild neurocognitive disorder. Like many syndromes that affect older adults, in MCI, it's often unclear what's the underlying cause of the brain not working as well as it should. Now, as you'll see when I explain Alzheimer's disease in a bit, in some people, it actually is underlying Alzheimer's disease that is causing the mild cognitive impairment. But MCI can easily be caused by other conditions that affect the brain. So we never want to assume that all MCI is Alzheimer's disease. In many, but not all people, MCI does end up being an intermediate stage between having normal brain function and eventually developing dementia. But in some people, MCI gets better, or there are other older adults who just seem to stay stable for years. I don't wanna keep spending time right now on mild cognitive impairment, but if you'd like to learn more about this condition, I have an article explaining how it should be evaluated and treated on better health while aging, and I'll post that link below. Let's now move on to defining dementia. Like mild cognitive impairment, dementia is also a syndrome, a package of symptoms and characteristics with multiple potential underlying causes. And dementia is like mild cognitive impairment, but worse, meaning that the cognitive decline has gotten to the point that the person is no longer able to manage most of their usual daily life activities independently. So for instance, they may have gone to the point at which they can no longer manage grocery shopping or meal preparation because their memory or thinking skills have gone so bad. Let me now take you through the criteria for dementia, which is also called major neurocognitive disorder. These are the criteria that were described in the most recent edition of what we call the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, also known as the DSM-5. They are this. First, there must be evidence of impairment in at least one cognitive domain. And cognitive domains are more than memory. The DSM-5 actually lists six domains to consider, which are learning and memory, language, executive function, complex attention, perceptual motor function, that last one relates to eye-hand coordination, visual spatial skills, and then there is social cognition, which means knowing how to behave appropriately in certain situations. Next on the list of criteria is that the impairment must be a significant decline from previous abilities. So the person should be worse in this type of memory or thinking skill than they were a few years ago. The next criteria is that the cognitive deficits must interfere with independence in everyday activities. Next on the list is that the impairments cannot only occur during delirium. So Delirium, as I explained in one of the other videos, is a state of worse than usual mental function that's brought on by acute illness, 
often hospitalization or surgery for older adults, but can also just happen from a bad infection, even if you're not hospitalized. And that illness can in itself cause brain dysfunction. But for something to be dementia, you can't just be confused or have memory problems while you are delirious due to a medical illness, a medication side effect, or some other cause of delirium. Next on the list of criteria is that the impairments can't be better accounted for by another mental disorder, such as major depression, schizophrenia, or another psychiatric condition. So basically, for a person to meet the criteria for dementia, a person has to be having memory or thinking problems that are persisting, that aren't due to delirium or recent illness, that don't appear to be only due to depression or another psychiatric condition, and the memory or thinking problems have to be bad enough that the person can no longer be independent in all the daily activities that they used to be able to manage on their own. So that's the syndrome of dementia. And in many cases, it's not entirely clear just what brain condition has damaged the brain cells and caused the cognitive problems. And that's because in usual medical care, what we call clinical care, people come to see us and we doctors see the external symptoms but we're not easily able to look inside the brain and tell what is damaging the brain cells. Now, you may be thinking, but wait, my mother or father had a brain scan such as an MRI or maybe a CAT scan. And doesn't that tell you doctors what's the underlying cause of their memory loss or thinking problems? And the answer is not really. Brain scans can hint at certain underlying causes and every once in a blue moon, we see something that is like a smoking gun and the obvious cause of the problems. But usually, by themselves, brain scans are not enough to definitively rule in or rule out the most common underlying causes of dementia. And what they definitely cannot do is distinguish between mild cognitive impairment and dementia, because there, the main difference is the question of have the cognitive changes, the memory and thinking problems, gotten bad enough to interfere with independence in daily life activities? And to answer that question, doctors need to talk to patients and especially to their families because the scans cannot answer the question of what is happening in real life. Okay, let's now talk about Alzheimer's disease. Now, the previous three terms that I covered, cognitive impairment, mild cognitive impairment, and dementia, refer to signs or syndromes that we doctors can observe and identify from the outside. But Alzheimer's disease is a fairly common neurodegenerative condition that is really defined by what is happening on the inside, in the brain. In Alzheimer's disease, for reasons that researchers are still working out, the brain starts accumulating deposits of a protein called amyloid beta. And these protein deposits create plaques or clumps among the brain cells. Some brain cells also begin to accumulate tangles of another protein called tau. And as all these changes accumulate, the brain cells, which we also call neurons, they get sick, they don't work as well, and eventually they die. And once enough neurons are malfunctioning or dead, the person starts to develop signs of cognitive impairment. Now, since it's often the neurons in the part of the brain responsible for memory and learning, often the parts along the side here, that are affected first, it's common for memory difficulties to be one of the earliest signs of Alzheimer's disease. But those signs of memory loss or other forms of cognitive dysfunction usually don't happen until the underlying damage has been going on for years, as in for 15 years or more. During that time, specialized tests that are generally only available to researchers can now detect signs of increased amyloid or other signs suggesting that Alzheimer's is developing in the brain. As Alzheimer's disease progresses, eventually it will get to the point at which it causes mild cognitive impairment, and then given enough time, things usually will progress to dementia. So what is the difference between Alzheimer's and dementia? Again, dementia is the overall syndrome of a person, usually an older person, having developed chronic cognitive impairments that are bad enough to impair daily life function. Whereas Alzheimer's disease is a specific neurodegenerative condition that affects brain cells and that eventually often leads to first mild cognitive impairment and then eventually to dementia. Now, there are other conditions that can cause dementia, 
such as vascular disease or Lewy body disease. And in fact, research shows that as people get over, if their brains are autopsied after death, the vast majority of the time, we find that older adults have more than one underlying cause of dementia, often a mix of Alzheimer's disease plus one of the other types. And this is called mixed dementia. That said, Alzheimer's disease is overall the most common underlying cause of dementia. It was also one of the earliest specific neurodegenerative brain disorders to be identified in the early 20th century. For these reasons, the terms Alzheimer's and dementia have historically been used almost interchangeably. And in modern times, if we diagnose someone with dementia in a regular clinic, unless they have certain symptoms that strongly suggest a different cause of dementia, it's basically considered acceptable to assume that it's probably Alzheimer's disease. Now, until pretty recently, people didn't get diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease until they had pretty obvious symptoms, usually at the level qualifying for dementia. Also, in my experience, people hate hearing that they have Alzheimer's, and doctors hate telling them. So diagnosis is often made quite late in the person's life, or sometimes not even at all. However, in the past several years, researchers have made amazing strides in being able to detect signs of Alzheimer's disease in the brain well before symptoms become apparent. This is now called preclinical Alzheimer's disease, and researchers are currently trying to develop treatments that can prevent or delay the progression to cognitive symptoms and eventual dementia. Now to date, there's still no treatment for preclinical or later Alzheimer's disease that clearly works to reverse or stall the disease. You may have heard that the FDA did approve a new drug for Alzheimer's called Aduhelm in 2021, but this approval was controversial because it wasn't clear that it's a clinically effective treatment. So what it did is that in studies, it did seem to reduce amyloid in the brain, but that came with very serious side effects, and it wasn't clear that it was going to stop the progression of Alzheimer's overall. So as of 2022, Medicare has said that it will only pay for this new Alzheimer's drug for patients who are enrolled in trials. So let's now recap the terms that I've covered in this video. Cognitive impairment refers to signs that the brain is malfunctioning, pretty general term. Mild cognitive impairment, or MCI, is a syndrome in which there are objective signs that memory or another thinking process are worse than normal, but things are not bad enough to interfere with most daily life activities, and otherwise, the problems aren't bad enough to qualify for dementia. And then dementia is a syndrome in which there's chronic cognitive impairment affecting memory or other thinking processes. It doesn't appear to be due to delirium or a psychiatric condition, and the problems have gone bad enough to affect independence in many daily life activities. And then Alzheimer's disease is a progressive neurodegenerative condition that slowly damages the brain, and that's the most common underlying cause of dementia. So if someone were to ask me to quickly explain dementia versus Alzheimer's, I would say that dementia is an umbrella term reflecting the condition of having permanent damage to the brain, whereas Alzheimer's disease is the most likely, but in my older patients, usually not the only, underlying cause of the brain changes that have led to cognitive impairment. I hope this video has helped you understand the difference between mild cognitive impairment, dementia, and Alzheimer's. Because if your parent gets evaluated for memory loss or other thinking problems, and I hope they will, chances are good that they'll be told it might be one of those three. Now you might be wondering, but how do I get my parent evaluated in the first place, especially if they don't want to go? Or what should I do next if they have been diagnosed with Alzheimer's or another form of dementia? Or how do I get them to accept the help they need? Don't worry, I'll be covering those questions and more in upcoming episodes. So be sure to subscribe or otherwise stay tuned. In the meantime, if you do have a question or topic that you'd like for me to cover in an upcoming episode, let me know in the comments. I'd love to hear from you and know what I can help you with. Thanks for watching, take care, and hope to see you soon in another video.